Well, we have made it to Genesis chapter 15, so you can turn there, and we're going to look at the entire chapter. It's a chapter where God formally establishes the covenant with Abraham. We are still calling him Abram right here. In a couple more chapters, we'll start calling him Abraham. But this is a covenant. It's known as the Abrahamic covenant. And the title of the study is, uh, the title of the study is Promises, Not Fear. The Lord meets a man that's dealing with fear. Um, and he establishes a covenant with him. In Ephesians chapter 2, around verse 12, we read something like this. It says that we who once were afar off and not a part of the promises and the covenants of God have been brought near. And he's speaking to the Gentiles, those uh, not, uh, that are not part of Israel. The, uh, you know, if you weren't a Jew, you're a Gentile. So that probably is most of us in here. Not all of us, probably most of us. And we weren't a part of those promises and those covenants, but through Jesus Christ, we've been brought in, as Paul would call it in the book of Romans, we've been what? Grafted in to these promises, these experiences. And what a joy it is. We're going to talk about that one covenant in particular, the new covenant um, that we have been brought into. But there are many covenants that God made with people throughout the Old Testament. And before the Lord had called Abram out of the land of the Chaldeans, he was out without the promises and the covenants of God. And then he was brought near. But the thing about a covenant is that it's, it's basically like a contract. It's an agreement. Let me give you a definition for what a covenant is. An agreement between two parties which binds them to certain commitments from one to another or to each other. Theologically, in relations between God and man, it denotes God's gracious commitment to bless man. And if you just leave it there for a second, in that last phrase, God's gracious commitment to bless man. As we go into this covenant and watch the Lord establish and ratify, legally kind of put in, you know, down, we say pen to paper, although it's a little bit different than that, the covenant, the contract, this is a gracious act of the Lord. All throughout the ancient world, there's, there was a type of contract. There was two of them in particular, or covenants, that were well known. One was a priority covenant, which were among two equals. So let's say you have land and I have the equipment to, you know, the animals and the seed to farm it. And so we enter into an agreement. And so this would be a priority uh, covenant. But the covenants that we read of between God and man are what are known as suzerainty suzerainty covenants and that's a covenant between a, a greater and a lesser typically it looked like this we just invaded your nation and you guys have great fruit and great harvest and so we're going to come and we're going to take 20 percent of all your stuff every year and we won't kill you this is our agreement and and so it was always when the greater would come into the lesser it was a top-down heavy-handed uh, oppression and there was really not much option that the lesser had. They were kind of just, all right, well, I mean, we don't want to die, so I guess we'll give you 20%. So we have the greater God coming and making a covenant with the lesser Abraham or Noah or um, uh, David or um, Moses. These different covenants that, uh, that we find throughout Scripture. But it's never a top-down, oppressive approach. What you think is so important because often there is this misconception of the character and the nature of God. That God is some heavy handed, I'm going to beat you up and if you don't do what I say, I'm going to grind you into the ground. Well, listen, God is sovereign and God certainly has the power and the authority to judge. But that's not the way he comes to us. He comes as a greater and he comes with grace and he comes with blessing. This is what he does. Yes, even in the Old Testament, this is what the covenants were. They were a kind creator God that was coming to his people and saying, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to do this, David. I'm going to do this, Moses. I'm going to do this, um, uh, Noah. I'm going to do this, Abraham. And these covenants were put in place. So maybe you have a misconception of God. That it's this top-down, heavy-handed, you know, walk my way or I'm going to squash you. That's not the way it is. 
And if you can just think about it, the creator of the universe comes and you'll see so clearly in this covenant and how it's ratified of God's commitment. So as you, we go through scripture, we find uh, different types of covenants. I've mentioned some of them. You have the Noahic, you have the Abrahamic, Mosaic. Um, uh, you have the Deuteronomic, you have the Davidic, you have the New Covenant. Others would add to this Edenic one and Eden and the Adamic one that he made with Adam. I'm not going to get into why some are, accept all of those as covenants and some don't. Just know that those are the ones that, that are out there. And I want to just move on and get actually into it. So we begin reading at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. So God comforts Abram in his fear. What's his fear? The, the verse 1 begins saying, after these things. So is there a connection? We can't say definitively, but is there a connection with the after these things and the things that preceded? What preceded? Well, in chapter 14, remember, Lot was taken captive. You had the eastern coalition of nations that came over into Canaan. Four kings came from the east. They overcame five kings of Canaan, took their lands, took their possessions, and left them dead on the battlefield. So this word came to Abram, and he put his army together, his household, his trained servants. They went after him. Uh, that, that nation and to get back Lot and he has victory and now he's back home and has met Melchizedek. He's back there in Hebron now um, at the trees of Mamre as a worshiper of the Lord. But this seems to be something that's happening in the night as we will see. You ever laid to bed late at night and thought about things and can't turn off your brain? Maybe some fears that start rolling through your head and what if this happens and what if that? This is Abram's night. He's afraid. He's like, you know, and I, we can't say definitively that he's afraid of these guys coming back. However, it is a logical fear. Oh, man, what was that noise out there? <laughs> you know, I really made these kings angry. You know, um, their ability to collect tribute was kind of, you know, they're cut out from beneath them because they were defeated and they got back the spoils. They were on this long trip and battle. They're probably coming back with more power. And every time some of the animals rustled, every time there was a noise, you could imagine him thinking, I wonder if that's them coming. So it's hard, not hard to imagine this being part of the fear. But you know, another fear might be what proceeds after, and certainly seems to be on the list here, and that is that he's worried about not having a child to inherit the promises that God has given to him. And, you know, I think all, a lot of us can relate to this idea is that we know the promises of God, we know what he has said to us, and yet there can be a fear that comes over us, like, Lord, how are you going to do this? How are you going to accomplish this? I know what you said, and it's like, well... At least I think I know what you said. I hope I know what you said. How is this going to happen? And Lord, I left everything behind. And I, I'm, I'm testifying that I'm going to be, I'm going to have a descendant and I'm going to be a, a great nations are going to come from me and I don't even have one child. Lord, what's going to happen? And so maybe it's a fear of seeing the fulfillment of the promises of God. But the Lord shows up to him and he says, don't be afraid. And this is what the Lord would say to you today. He's not yelling it at you. He doesn't have his finger pointing down at you. No, quit being afraid. Don't you know who I am? No, he's saying, don't be afraid. I'm your shield. And I'm your reward. And I love how it's phrased here. It says, don't be afraid. I am your shield. And it doesn't read, and I will bring you exceedingly great rewards. Which would be, that, that's, that still would be wonderful, right? For this greater to be speaking to us, the lesser. But he goes well beyond that and he says, I am your exceedingly great reward. And then we've got to keep that in focus. When we latch on to the fact that God is our protector and he's going to deliver our souls from this life into the next life, into glory and into the kingdom that he has established for us there, that will cheer our heart. And anything that's coming against us here, it's only temporary, and we know that. But to know that he is my reward. It's not just what he does that's going to be my reward. It's him. It's the Lord himself. And if we take this and apply this to ourselves, being in the new covenant, 
and under the new covenant, which we'll talk a little bit about in just a moment, but that this is ours and that what do we read in Ephesians? That we've been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places that are what? What does it say? In Christ Jesus. He is our reward as well. It was true for Abram, but it's true for us as well that he is a reward. When, when the news began to spread, we found the Messiah. When the brothers were, you know, were talking, hey, Peter, I think, I think I met the Messiah. The question wasn't, well, what can he do for us? Well, they kind of dealt with that a little bit along the way. But their immediate response was not, well, what can he do for us? Their immediate response was, the Messiah is here? Period. Exclamation point. Nothing else needs to be said because the realization of the promise had come to them. And the Lord would want to say to you that are afraid today, maybe, because maybe you're afraid of all that's going on in the country this past week. And what's going to happen? We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know. We, I mean, look at the year that we had in 2020, all these different things. But this is what I can assure you of. There'll be something else in about three or four weeks that's going to set our hair on fire all over again. But the kingdom of God is certain. And your reward is Jesus himself. You don't need anything else. I don't need anything else. I'm not saying be, be disinterested in you know, what's going on in this as a, as a country. Be a good citizen. Be a good neighbor. Do the right thing. But we have marching orders from our king that says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. I think we probably all should read that verse about a dozen times this, this week every day. Keep it on the kingdom. We know what we've been called to do. We're called to love one another. We're called to love our enemies. To love our enemies. We're called to reach the lost. We're called upon to use our gifts. These are biblical, certain, eternal truths given to us by Jesus himself. All the other stuff, hey, it's temporary. We're passing through. So I don't know what is causing you great fear. But I can tell you this, that if you're watching your news feed all day long and you're watching the news all day long, stop doing that. I want to be informed. You are informed enough. You are so informed that you are being overcome with the information. Get some new information in your head. Like, the Lord is your shield and he is your reward. What does that mean? That's a whole Bible study in and of itself, but it's one that is worth your effort. But this is what the Lord says to Abram. This is what he says to us. Well, let's move on to this idea that Abram was fearful, maybe not having a descendant. He wonders who his descendant is going to be. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. So he comes up with a plan. It's like, you give me a promise that I'm going to have a descendant. Now, he's going to make this mistake twice, right? <laughs> um, this is the lesser of the two mistakes. But he says, listen, I, I, I got you. you know, I'll just have Eleazar as my descendant. That, that's what we're going to do here. And just a, a little side note so that you can know that as the Bible was being written, it fit within the culture, even as I described those two, um, two different types of covenants that could be made. But even in this little statement here, that somebody would look to take a servant of theirs that was born in their house and make and adopt them and make them their heir, this is exactly what we find in other literature that was written around the same time. In the Code of Hammurabi and the Nuzi tablets, it speaks of childless husbands and wives adopting as an heir a servant born in their house to receive the inheritance. This is written at a time that it, it connects with the culture. It represents what was going on, meaning it wasn't just written by somebody dreaming things up sometime afterwards. It, it actually fits with the time in which Abram was writing. But aren't we kind of like Abram? We know the promises of God. We have a sense of what he wants to do. Maybe the Lord has even given you a specific word of how he wants to move and work in your life. And you hear that, but you're like, yeah, but I don't have an heir. 
Well, I know what I can do. We can, that's exactly what we'll do. I mean, I know that that was a promise, but maybe I've just, we'll just do this and we begin to get involved and begin to look for a fleshly answer to a spiritual promise that the Lord has given. He's going to do that again with Hagar. Sarah will be right along there making that mistake with him. But trust in the Lord. You know, the question seems to be in Abraham's mind, you can deliver property into my hands, but I'm not certain you can deliver a posterity into my hands. And we look at things in our life, and we can trust God for this thing, but we have a hard time trusting. Listen, that's universal. We all are like that. I'll raise my hand first. There are certain things I have no problem trusting the Lord in. There are other things that come up in life, and I can begin to have a That's where my faith is challenged and stretched, and I need to grow. We all have those areas of our life. We would do well to know what areas those are so that we don't make this mistake. But God is able to deliver property like he did when he rescued Lot, but he's also able to deliver a posterity. And this is what he goes on to say in verses 4 through 5. I'm going to give you a physical descendant. He says, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one... Eleazar shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. So we know that he's having this conversation at night. And actually, this is the first time we actually hear conversation So far, every encounter that Abram has had with the Lord has been monologue, God speaking to him. But now it's a dialogue. They're speaking together. And it's at night. He's in his tent, and and the Lord says, let's go outside. Let's get some fresh air here, buddy. (laughs) Don't be afraid. You see all those stars? Count them up for me. Oh, you can't do that? That's because that's going to be your descendants. You're going to have more than that. I'm going to give you a physical descendant, and you're going to have more than this. Now, this is saying something because they're about 100 years old. About 100 years old. A couple of weeks ago when I was announcing that... uh, Megan and Steve, uh, Megan, my daughter, uh, Steve, Steve, my son-in-law, that they had their baby. I also said, and Rebecca's expecting another. Now, we're only in our 50s, and um, yeah, you laughed. And that, but, and that, you know, it's like that, that would, she's not really, she's expecting another grandchild, okay? So, um, but that, that thought is like, wow, okay, I guess you guys, you know, are going to have a child later on. That's not going to, you know, you can talk to her about this. She, on April Fool's, called me up. It was my day off. I was sleeping in. She called me off on April Fool's. I woke up with the phone. I go, I said, hello. And she goes, hey, I think I'm pregnant. (laughs) And I'm like, what? And um, it wouldn't be the end of the world. I mean, love kids. It's just not the plan. (laughs) And so um, I hung up. Actually, I think I slammed the phone into my pillow. And um, I was like, you, oh, no. And then she called back. She goes, oh, by the way, April Fool's. So this is, uh, this is how things roll in our household. Um, but they're 100. They're 100 years old. And they don't have kids. It's logical. I mean, let's be a realist here, Sarah. We're not going to have kids. We're, it's going to be LEAs. Or let's be real about this. Lord says, Let's have faith about this. I'm going to give you a child. And so he promises this descendant. Look at verse 6. It says, And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. The Lord said it, and he believed it. Abraham believed in the Lord, and it is counted as righteousness unto himself. He believed. It doesn't say in the promise, does it? It says he believed In the Lord. His faith is deeper than just one single promise. His faith is upon the Lord and what he says and what he will do. It's all of that combined. This biblical principle of righteousness coming through belief is mentioned throughout the scriptures, but this chapter 15 story is picked up upon in the New Testament and is taught in at least three other places that I know in James and Galatians and Romans chapter 4. Turn there, grab your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 4. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible and on this Old Testament story which was written for our learning and our admonition 
the Apostle Paul writes about it and gives us how we should be looking at this and relates it to the new covenant, our faith in the Lord. But the whole point that he's driving at here in Romans chapter 4 is you're not saved by works. You're saved by faith. And he's going to pick up on that phrase, and he believed in the Lord, and then he accounted or imputed, transferred it to him for righteousness. So let's read beginning at verse 13. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promises made of no effect. Because... The law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of him who he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so, your, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. And being, I love it, fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. Verse 24, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. So when we have funds in our accounts, and let's say you have to transfer money from your savings to your checking to cover some bills, you make a transfer. You impute money from one account to another. Like, yeah, I don't have that account. Okay, so mom and dad impute money to your account. Somebody helps you out and money gets transferred into your account. A wire transfer, bank transfer, it's imputed. It's accounted to you, their money. Well, spiritually speaking, we have an account and the balance is zero. Actually, the balance is worse than zero. It is overdrawn and we have no way to fill it. Nobody can give us the money that we need, spiritually speaking, except for the Lord himself, who has an infinite account of righteousness because our deficiency is we are unrighteous and you must be righteous to enter into heaven. And God does not want to leave us outside of the promises and fellowship with him. So he sent his son to die on the cross and rise again from the dead that through faith in him, just like Abram had faith in God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, Paul makes the point, as we believe in Jesus, that righteousness is transferred into our spiritual bank account. Maybe you came in here this morning thinking, there's no way that I could ever be a part of this Christian thing because, man, my life is a mess and I know I couldn't live it out and I couldn't live it right. And I just, I'm, you know, so I, you guys have nice songs. I like the thing you got going on here, but it's not for me. No, it's for you. It's for you. Jesus died on the cross for you just like he died on the cross for me because we're all in that same boat that you just identified. As a matter of fact, what you just said is that 100% biblical whether you know it or not. All of us on our own have no hope. But God is willing to transfer into your account the righteousness that you need to get to heaven. To get to heaven, you must be perfectly righteous. That counts us all out. Except one man. His name is Jesus. He lived a perfect, righteous, perfectly righteous life. And the Bible says that through faith in him, we are given the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When you believe in the Lord, what is transferred to you is what was transferred to Abram, and that is righteousness, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So you believe that he died on the cross, and he rose from the dead, and now 
the Lord puts it in your account so you are welcomed in his presence. And you're like, yeah, but I can't live it out. Not on your own, you can't. But this new covenant that we are talking about right now that Paul transitioned into, we read that God writes it upon our heart to do it. When you become a Christian, you will feel a, a spiritual compulsion to do the right thing, which does not mean you are perfect, but it means when you miss the mark, you seek to rectify that. You repent and you try to live it out. And now God gives you his spirit to live it out. So if you're only looking at yourself and what you've done and how you've lived your life and the ability that you would have on your own to live a good life, you're right. None of us can do it. But in Christ Jesus, yeah, we can be justified. We can be acquitted before the throne room of God. But you must put faith in the Lord just like Abram had to put faith in in God. And here's the point that Paul goes on to make in Romans. There's only one way that people have ever been saved, and it is through faith. And through that faith, God graciously imputes his righteousness to us. That's the way people are always saved. The law of Moses was not a means to save people. The law of Moses was a means to live a good life, to have a great country, and, and to tell us we can't do it, that we need a savior. It was a schoolmaster for us. So this Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 15 is important theologically because it becomes a type of how we enter into the new covenant that Jesus established. Remember, they're in the upper room. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant first mentioned there in Jeremiah chapter 31. And he says that to eat this bread that is my body broken for you and to drink this cup, the cup was representative of his shed what? His shed blood. The covenants had signs. For Abraham, the covenant's gonna have the sign of circumcision. For Moses, the sign of the covenant was the Sabbath. For Noah, the sign of the covenant was what? The rainbow. For us in the church and for, all, and for Israel, because we're just grafted into this covenant, we were a part of the covenants, but now we've been brought in. Thank you very much, Lord. Glad to, to be a latecomer, but glad I got to get in. And we are brought in, and the sign of the covenant is the blood of Jesus. And so the Lord says, when you get together and you eat this bread and you drink this cup, remember me. Remember this covenant that you've been brought into. I mean, it's amazing to think, here's a man in the Ur of the Chaldeans, and the Lord says, come on over here, and the greater says to the lesser, I'm going to make a covenant with you, and I'm going to bless you. Wow, could you imagine being that guy? I mean, he didn't have a Bible. He had nothing but the experience and the word of the Lord, and he believed it. But he would have had to have felt like, who am I? But isn't that how we feel? Who are we? that the Lord would, it would make a covenant with us. And he has made a covenant with us. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 15. In case you're getting a little bit sleepy, it's about to get interesting. Now, when we make contracts and agreements today, what is the sign of the, of, of the covenant we make? It's usually our signature, and if it's really important, in the presence of a notary, right? And so that's the seal, that's the sign. Well, what was the way in which you went through making a covenant, a suzerain tree covenant, covenant back in Abram's day? Let's read together. He says, then he said, verse 7, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Get these five animals. Then he brought all these to him and he cut them down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. And so what's going on here? I mean, basically, 
What God said, my own words, okay, my own words. God said, Abram, make an alleyway of death. Go get the animals, slaughter them, kill them, and just get their carcasses and make this alleyway of death. Now, Abram would have known exactly what was going on because this is a blood covenant. It's, this is not sacrifice. This is not worship. This is a blood covenant that's being entered into. You might want to write down Genesis, uh, sorry, Jeremiah 34, 8 through 11, and verses 17 through 20. Jeremiah 34, 8 through 11, and Jeremiah 34, 17 through 20, and you can read in the Bible where this is going on. Well, what's taking place? As you walked, as this is being made, what typically would happen is the two people who entered into the covenant would be, would, they would walk through this alleyway of death, and essentially what they were saying is, don't you dare think about breaking this covenant. Because if you break this covenant, you're going to look like that. It was a pretty powerful symbol. Um, one ancient document records um, a blood covenant that was entered into, and this is the, how the language goes. It says, this is not the Bible, okay, but it, it's a, a similar type of covenant. This head is not the head of a lamb. It is the head of Maltalu. If Maltalu sins against this somat, just as the head of the spring lamb is torn off, the head of Maltalu will be torn off and his sons. Thank you very much. Nice doing business with you. So, so that's what's going on. It's weird to us. It's strange to us. But every indication is, is that they were entering into this blood sacrifices. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to condense this. In verses 13 through 16, there's some, I think about seven prophecies that are given to Abram. All of them have come to pass. All of them have been fulfilled. Um, and let's just read them. It says, then he said to Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. That land would be called Egypt. And will serve them and they will afflict them. And they did serve and afflict them. For 400 years, and that's how long they were there, was 400 years. Exodus 12, 40 talks about that. And also, a nation whom they serve, I will judge. They went, Egypt went through the plagues. They had the judgment at the Red Sea. After that, they shall come out with great possession. And Israel plundered Egypt. They left with silver and gold and all kinds of valuable items. Egyptians were just glad for them to go. Verse 15, now as for you, you shall go to your father in peace, and you shall be buried at a good old age. So last prophecy here is, or not the last one, but another prophecy is that you're not going to have to go through these dark times. He had that dark vision of this trouble that was coming. He says, but you're not going to endure it. And indeed, Abram died before any of this took place. Verse 16, but in the fourth generation, so 400 years later, they shall return here to the promised land. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. I want to just pause for a moment on verse 16. All of those fulfilled prophecies can tell us that God is true to his word. And that God is going to continue to be true to this covenant that he made with Israel, excuse me, with Abraham and his descendants Israel. But what is this statement that they would return to their promised land after the Amorites' sin was complete. The Amorites were people that were dwelling in the land while Abram was alive. And these were some wicked people. They did sinful things. Um, they, among the most egregious things that they did was they would take their children and they would sacrifice them in worship of these uh, false deities and they would take their life. There are other things that went on as well. But the Lord says... It's going to be 400 years before you come into this land because the sin of the Amorites has not reached its limit. God is being patient with this group of people. And he's going to wait. Can you imagine being patient with somebody for 400 years? Like, yeah, I'm working on four minutes. No, I can't think of 400 years. But God was patient for 400 years with these people. So I'm not going to judge them yet. I'm going to wait. But when you come into this land, when you come back into the land, I want you to hear this. Two things. One is going to be a fulfillment of prophecy. It's going to be a promise fulfilled and realized, but it's also going to be judicial. 
It's two things. It's going to be a blessing for you, but it's going to be judgment for them. A lot of times people will say of the conquest of Israel as they went in and drove out the inhabitants that, well, I could never worship a God that would drive out people out of their land. That's not kind. That's not fair. That's not just. But what you must realize, it was judgmental. It was meant to be the consequence for perpetually and continually killing children and other sins that they had committed till it comes to its, its fulfillment. And then the Lord says, now you will be judged. We have a laws. We have laws in our land. We have judges that carry out justice. And when that doesn't happen, we say that is unjust. When a judge does not punish people who have broke the law, we don't think highly of those judges, do we? Their job is to do that. Well, God is a judge, and he was going to judge them for their wickedness and for their sins so that this would stop and that this would cease. But what does Israel do once they get into the land? Over time, they begin to do the same exact thing. God doesn't play favorites. He brings judgment on them and sends them out of the land until they repent, and then they come back in. Because if it was wrong for the Amorites... It's wrong for the Israelites. This is not favoritism. They were chosen, but it was a promise given, but it was also, secondly, a promise given, but it was also a judicial conquest that was going on. Verse 17, we're back to this alleyway of death, right? This vision that he's having. And we talked about how two people would usually walk through this uh, you know, this lineup of animals. But here, read this. It says, And it came to pass when the sun went down, so we're into the second evening, and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. This is representative of the Lord. But what do we notice? It's only the Lord that walks through this. Who's missing? The person he's entering into the covenant with. He's put him in a deep sleep. So it's not both of them walking through. So this is the Lord's way of saying, I take full responsibility. This is a unilateral responsibility on my part to fulfill this covenant of the greater making it with the lesser. I'm going to do this is what the Lord is saying. And it is not going to be dependent upon your performance, Abraham. Because in the next chapter, we're going to see Abraham fail. And many times throughout their history, the seed of Abraham, Israel, failed. And yet this covenant remains intact and true. And it is what we would call an unconditional covenant. Not meaning there's no expectations, but that even if the expectations are meant, God is still going to fulfill it. We come back to our own experience with the Lord, and we are in a covenant with the Lord. Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The Lord's going to finish the work that he's begun in you, and he's begun in me. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your faith and trust in the Lord. I'm so glad that the Lord went to the cross himself, that in a sense he walked that path of sacrifice by himself. And he redeemed us, and he will complete the work. Could you imagine if the Lord says, okay, you are now saved. Congratulations, you have received my, my work. Now, here's the thing. You're going to go to heaven. I'm your reward. But just make sure you don't ever mess up again. Because if you ever mess up again, and you know what the word says, you mean, you know, lusting your heart, you hate, you want to murder. These are things that are serious. If you don't obey the laws of the land. And if he just began to go through all the lists of ways in which we could sin. Don't get angry. Make sure you love me every day with all your heart, all day long. Because if you mess up, you're going to lose it all. At that point, most of us would say, I've got a plan. Just take me right now. <laughs> just take me right now because I know how this story is going to end. But the Lord has made a covenant with us and he's going to fulfill it even when we fail. Now, if you hear that, say, oh, good. I can fail and it's still good. And you're thinking now you can continue on living in sin. You're probably not saved. You probably have not experienced salvation because a saved person does not have that response to the grace of God. A saved person says, oh, Lord, help me to follow you. Help me to walk after you. 
We close here in verses 18 through 21 in this Abrahamic covenant. And in it, it's quite simple. He says, here's the territory of the borders of the land I'm giving to you. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt. And he goes on to describe the borders of this land. Israel never fully possessed all of this. So the land is very much a part of the promise of this Abrahamic covenant, which God alone said, I will fulfill. Genesis 17, 7 through 8 emphasizes the same point about the land. He says, if you look part way down there, it says also, I give you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as what kind of a possession? Everlasting possession. So God entered a covenant and said, this is an everlasting uh, covenant that you will have the land. God, in the new covenant, we've entered into an everlasting relationship with him. And he says he will give us the land of heaven, if you will. We will have eternal life. I have a problem when people come back and say, but this covenant is no longer valid. <laughs> because it's called everlasting. And if this everlasting promise is not everlasting, then how everlasting is a promise of eternal life? So this is my axe to grind, if you will, when people say the promises to God are no longer intact to the nation of Israel. One last verse. In the establishing of the new covenant, the Lord makes a promise to Israel. But I think the language is important for us to know that God is not done with Israel. So says, thus says the Lord, verse 35, who gives the sun for light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the seas and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances, the sun, the star, the moon, if those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will cast off all the seed of Israel for all they have done, says the Lord. This is the Lord's way of saying, I will never be done with Israel. The stars aren't going anywhere. You're not going to find the outer limits of space. And you're not going to make a beautiful, uh, a complete map of the inner parts of this earth. None of those things have happened, nor will they happen. And it's the Lord's way of saying, Israel will have this. Does this mean that everything Israel's done throughout her history is perfect and right? And today she's a perfect nation? No, it does not mean that. They can sin just like any other people. But it does mean that God's made this promise. When is it going to be fulfilled? Because it has not yet fully been fulfilled at the second coming of Christ. These things will be fulfilled. As we close here, kind of end the way we began. Here's a man that had fear. Maybe of being attacked. Of not seeing the promises of God fulfilled in his life. And the Lord shows up and says, let me make a promise. Let's enter into an agreement together. We should be amazed at that for Abraham. But the Lord has brought us into a, a covenant as well that's greater than that covenant. It's a covenant of new life. And the Lord says, I will protect you. I'm going to take you to the other side. No enemy is going to come against you and prosper. And I'm your reward. I will fulfill all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. We can trust in him this morning and we should be trusting in him. And let's pray. Father, we are grateful that you are a God of grace, that you, the greater, the greatest, would come to us the least. It wouldn't be surprising, Lord, if you came and you made a treaty and a covenant that just simply warned us in anger and walked away, but you've not done that. You've made covenants of grace with us because you love us and you want us to have blessing. You want us to have you. You want us to have eternal life, and we say thank you. Lord, in this life, we are many times we are just like Abram. We're people of faith, but in the midst of having faith, we get troubled, and fear comes over us. And Lord, I pray for any brother or any sister that is feeling that fear that they would just hear you say, I'm your shield, I'm your reward. 
You're mine. You're with me. You're okay. Okay. 